on in. All right, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Amy Freeman. I am the Scholarly Communication Librarian here at the University Libraries. Um, feel free to introduce yourself with the chat. It's always nice to hear a little bit more about what you're working on, what you're studying, uh, what your research is. And we can hopefully cater uh, this talk a little bit towards the things that you're hoping to achieve. So today we are talking about digital projects. In the first half of the session, I am going to talk to you about how you can create plans for building digital projects, how you can identify content management systems and web hosting for your digital projects. And we are going to look at some tools that will help you, help you bring your research to life online. And then the second half, we're going to look at WordPress uh, closely, and we will walk through some of the different functionalities that will be useful um, using this software for creating digital projects. So when a lot of folks talk about moving their research online, they are talking about posting it online as it currently exists. So sharing their manuscripts online, you know, probably a PDF without a lot of minimal tools um, for digital interaction. Uh, that might be on ResearchGate, on some sort of repository. But what we are talking about today goes a little bit further. We are talking about creating born digital content, content that really could not exist in any other way than digital. And of course, it lives on the web and it is available but to anyone. We call this sort of a scholarship, digital scholarship. Uh, everybody has a slightly different definition of that, but I think there's a quote here on the screen by Abby Rumsey uh, that I'll let you read over that does a really good job of describing exactly what digital scholarship is. Um, to me, to those of us here at the library, what digital scholarship does is it uses digital methods and tools to do things like conduct research, to analyze data, uh, and then present scholarship back to the larger online community. You might hear this referred to as digital humanities, um, but we wanna make sure that we're including all fields, all disciplines. So we've brought in that out to digital scholarship. So you might have the question, uh, why would you choose to create a digital project? It can be quite a lot of work. It can also be very time consuming when you compare creating some sort of digital project with maybe publishing a paper. But there are some really good reasons why more and more scholars have chosen to get involved in this type of research. So digital scholarship, like I mentioned earlier, produces research that is online, is completely visible to anyone, anywhere, even outside of academia. So it's a really good way for you to showcase your work in a nice, open, visible form that allows other people not just to read your work, but actually to interact with it and engage with it. Those people might include um, K through 12 students and teachers. They might be historians, they might be the media. Uh, really, it could be anybody who's interested in knowledge for the sake of knowledge. So with digital scholarship, with these digital projects, your website viewers can maybe explore 3D models. They can see information or data visualizations. They could watch videos that you've created listen to podcasts, they could download databases that you've built, uh, or metadata-rich digital collections. Uh, they might could explore annotated content, take guided tours, all sorts of things. And in most cases, users are going to follow along and learn in the ways that make the most sense to them, rather than following a more linear or prescribed path, like you know, start to finish in a book, chapter by chapter, that's associated with traditional scholarship. So I want to show you two um, really good examples of digital scholarship. And the first actually comes out of USC right here. Um, and this is called the Digital Pyrenees. This is focused on the works of an 18th century graphic artist who is best known for his architectural studies of Rome and, um, interestingly, his imaginary prisons. So this site makes his rare works available in this nice interactive digital edition. And it also serves to provide all sorts of context into the artist, his works and their connections. So um, on this site, which I will make sure that I provide to you and when I send out the slides, you can take sort of a guided tour through all, all sorts of different themes and concepts. So for example, I could start with Roman iniquities. 
um, roll down the content to begin with the frontispiece, or I could continue to work in volumes. And so what's really interesting here is if I hover over the menu, I could explore by uh, works and volumes, genres, subjects, or themes. I could look at the bibliography or the glossary, or I could explore visualizations to look at connections between all of the different content. And so this might take just a moment to load because it's a really big, extensive site. But let's see if we're able to pull it up. Give it just a minute. Hope for the best. Um, if it takes a little longer than we have, I do want to point out there are different types of visualizations that you can look at. Uh, you can uh, explore a grid, a list, a map, uh, even a word cloud. And you can look at the different types of content to work with those visualizations. So, for example, you could look through the past that the authors have created, or you could explore how the tags or the themes are related to each other. And it looks like that might take a little bit more time than we have. But like I said, I'll make sure that I uh, send you this URL so that you can explore it on your own. Another nice website that I hope you have some time to explore is called the Digital Giza. This is a project that started way back in the year 2000 at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. They had an initial goal of digitizing all archaeological documentation from the Harvard expeditions to Giza um, in you know, the first half of the 1900s, and then making that information freely available online for anybody to use. Since that whole project actually moved to Harvard in 2011, the project really expanded their scope. So they've partnered with other institutions around the world that uh, were also involved in excavations to bring together as much um, data as possible about the site. You can see, of course, here from the site that you can explore 3D visualizations of um, the Giza Plateau as it might have looked when it was first built. You can look at resources designed for teachers and students. Uh, you can work um, and build your own collections in here. Uh, what I do want to do is show you um, some of these models and tours here. So, for example, I can start this 3D tour or I could scroll down to guided tours and even take virtual tours of these sites, which is really interesting. Again, I'll send you the links and I encourage you to poke around with those. They're, they're a lot of fun to look through. Um, both of these actually are still works in progress. That means that you know even after many years, in some cases, a couple of decades, um, these projects aren't complete. They're still having content built to them. So they're constantly evolving, constantly changing, constantly being expanded um, and improved. So that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about creating digital projects. So if you have decided that this type of project might be something that you're interested in, whether on that enormous scale or something maybe a little bit smaller, we'll talk about how you can get started. So with any project, including digital projects, there are lots of factors to consider right at the onset. And the first thing that you need with a digital project is a project summary. What are going to be the main points of your project? Are there specific benefits to creating this as a digital project uh, as opposed to a more traditional research format, like a, um, a paper or a manuscript for a full monograph? This isn't a summary that's going to be set in stone, but you'll think that you'll find that it's particularly useful if you do wind up needing to apply for some outside funding. You can also think about who your target audience is. Again, anybody can view that site once it's online, but it is okay to think if uh, whether or not you want to focus it more towards one or two groups. Uh, you do want to, if you can, avoid language that's overly scholarly, uh, because you do want your site to benefit anybody who does come across it. Think about who's going to be involved in that project. Is it just going to be you? Are you going to need additional support? Uh, a lot of times digital projects are going to involve collaboration across scholars, digital specialists, you know, programmers, librarians, all sorts of folks. So think about who could provide useful contributions to the project. Might there be you know, students that you're working with or peers who would like to get involved? Funding is very important. It's sometimes the downfall of digital projects because it's, of course, not necessarily free to create and host and preserve a digital project. You might have to pay for the specialists we talked about who have uh, skill sets you don't have, like maybe a, a web developer or an editor. Uh, think about long-term web hosting or file storage. 
all of these have costs associated with them. And so if that's the case, you will need to seek some sort of um, funding source, whether that's an internal grant or an external grant. Um, fortunately, there are a lot out there. You could look at um, the NEH. They have a great program that is worth um, investigating. And then of course, next you want to think about your content management system or your publishing platform. And that's what we're talking about most today, uh, WordPress. Ta picking the right content management system for your project is uh, essential because that is going to make your project easier to develop and it's gonna make it ultimately more user-friendly for your guests. And, and so we'll talk about um, WordPress, of course, but we'll also just kind of briefly touch on one or two others. Since you're creating a digital project, uh, there are lots of tools available to you that can enhance your project. Um, some of these do require a high level of technical knowledge. Some of them are a little bit expensive to use, while others are free or open source and can be accessed through a browser. At the library, we have um, gone ahead and we've pulled out some digital tools that you are welcome to use. All of these are either very low cost or free. Um, and we found that these are pretty low barrier tools from a technical technical perspective. Um, so if you're interested in finding tools for creating annotations or building a timeline, uh, mapping, all sorts of things, feel free to check out this, uh, this guide. And then um, moving back a little bit to space and uh, to funding, you have to think about space and storage. So these are integral parts of whatever project you're working on. Some publishing platforms like WordPress make it really easy to maximize space by letting users pull in media from other sources, while others do wind up posting quite a lot of original content. Uh, and that can take up a great deal of storage. The library can help provide assistance for storage space depending on your needs, and I will talk about that in just a moment. Copyright and permissions are, are very practical considerations. So when you're building this digital project, you are posting your content publicly. So you need to think about the use of your or your university's intellectual property, uh, as well as the intellectual property of other people. I am sure that you know that just because something is available on the web or has been digitized, that doesn't mean that it's copyright free. So if you're looking for content to include in your project and you don't have something specific in mind, uh, you can always search for Creative Commons licensed content. Um, that's content that has been licensed for you to use it in, in certain specific ways. But if you want to incorporate copyrighted works into your project, uh, fully protected copyrighted works, you need to very carefully consider those uses. Um, you will might be making complex copyright decisions based on exceptions in copyright law, or you might be dealing with licensing or permissions. On the other hand, um, just because you are the person who's posting your creative works, your scholarly works on the web, doesn't mean that you're giving up your copyright, right? Your creative works of authorship are going to be automatically copyrighted as long as they're both original and fixed. And most digital projects are going to meet those terms. Um, I'm very happy to talk to you about copyright and provide some best practices. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, you know, keep in mind, I am not a lawyer. I can't give you legal advice, but I'm happy to share some resources with you um, if that's something that you're considering. You also want to think about sustainability and preservation. It is very challenging to maintain an active digital project over several years. Um, even for people who are digital humanities specialists, platforms change, they update, they shut down. Um, you might have incorporated media that's been removed. Uh, and also it can just be expensive to host a site for many years. You, you know, from a personal or professional level, you might not be interested in maintaining the site forever or making changes to make it active and relevant for, um, for perpetuity. So you want to think in advance what the potential lifespan of your project is going to be and what you'd like to do if and when you'd eventually like to retire the site. If you intend to eventually shut it down, you might want to think about a plan to archive the site and its content. And this can be done pretty easily using a web archiving tool like um, Web Recorder or Internet Archive. And it's actually a service that we offer here at the library as well. And then last but not least, you need to think about publicity. Once your site is up, that is fantastic. 
But how do you get people to find your site? How do you get them interested in using your site? Uh, of course, you could think about search engine optimization, and you can use some of those same tools that you might to promote your regular published research. But you might also want to share your project through uh, relevant teaching and research listservs or on repositories or databases that are created to index these scholarly um, or these educational resources. Uh, if your area has a communications department, I am quite sure they'll have some good ideas for you uh, for promotion as well. So those are some uh, basic considerations to think about. Of course, there are more, um, but if you consider all of those things, that will at least give you a good start uh, for the creation and the implementation of your project. <clears throat> so we are going to move beyond that theoretical, and we are going to focus on our platforms now, specifically WordPress. As I mentioned, you do need a content management system to build, to publish, and make your work available on the web. And there are lots of options out there for you. Some of these have different strengths. Um, some of them are more suitable for uh, certain projects over another. Um, three very common CMSs that are used for digital projects are WordPress, of course, but also Scalar and Omeka, which maybe would be used more for um, creating a digital exhibit. But know that there are plenty of others that are out there if these don't suit your particular needs. If WordPress is not for you, that's okay. Just reach out to me and I'm more than happy to help you find a more suitable option. So <clears throat> moving into WordPress. Uh, WordPress is a web platform that is a very popular choice. It's easy to work with, which is probably why about a third of all websites actually do use WordPress as their hosting platform. WordPress is an open source content management system, which means that it is free to install as long as you have a domain name and a web host, which we'll talk about more in a minute. It is an excellent platform if you have limited technical experience. But even if you are an expert, it's still a really great choice because it is so flexible. WordPress offers you know, thousands of unique themes that you can use and customize um, to change the look and the feel of your site. And you can use plugins, which are um, literally little pieces of software that you can plug into your site to add or extend WordPress functionalities. These plugins can be general purpose, like for example, um, there are lots of search engine optimization or SEO plugins that can make your site more discoverable, or they might be directly relevant to your digital project, like it could be a timeline or a mapping plugin. Just like the other platforms I mentioned, um, WordPress does let you embed a wide variety of content. Um, and once you've done that, it results in a clean, user-friendly website. Um, if you're interested in a blog, it's also really great for blog style content because actually WordPress first started as a blogging platform. So before I move into a demo, I want to show you one project that was made using WordPress that I think is really neat. This project is called Red Thread, A Journey Through Color. This comes out of the University of Oregon and it grew out of a course, actually. So somebody working with their students um, <clears throat> that that looked into the research of the history of the color red around the world. Like where, what did the color red come from? Um, where does it occur naturally? How was it presented? Um, what is it symbolized in different cultures and religions? And so in this um, WordPress created site, you can explore um, a geographic map. There is lots of um, research that has been digitized and made available, um, as well as objects from campus collections. There are, if you scroll back up, additional resources. Uh, you can even look at assignments that students have um, completed while working on this project. So I just think this is a really cool example of um, sort of a low barrier site that you can create using WordPress that winds up being really nice, a really nice scholarly digital project. So <clears throat> WordPress and all the other platforms that we talk about do require web hosting. Um, web hosting is something that you can obtain on your own. It's usually pretty cheap and easy to get. But fortunately, the university libraries provides an even easier solution, which is a domain and web hosting platform 
for digital projects that is available to USC Columbia faculty, staff, and grad students um, who are intending to create a digital project at no cost. So again, you can put, you can install WordPress on your own, but this is a nice, easy solution that provides you with um, one gigabyte of space for free. If you do choose to use Create Digital for WordPress management, you are going to have access to something called a control panel or a C panel, where you can manage all of the elements of your hosting account. Um, Create Digital is often used to install and manage different applications like WordPress, um, but you can also use it to do things like create subdomains and there's lots of other tools. And so let me show you this platform. I'm not sure if any of you already have an account with Create Digital, but if not, it's usccreate.org and you just click the get started button. The first time you use it, um, you will need to register for an account that goes through an approval process. And once you've been approved, you're able to create your own subdomain. Um, from that subdomain back at the USC Create um, log homepage, you can log in and access your cPanel once it's been activated. So on this, you have access to something called an Installatron where you can install lots of applications like WordPress. Um, you also have the ability to work with domains, you can subdomains, uh, you can, um, which gives you additional spaces to install different projects. Uh, you have a file manager, of course, which lets you install, access, and edit files that are stored on your hosting account. Um, <clears throat> you have PHP admin, which does allow you to access databases on your web hosting account. Um, all of this maybe seems a little bit overwhelming when you're just, you know, thinking, okay, I just want to install and use WordPress. Um, but that's okay if this is something that you don't necessarily need. You can always uh, minimize the areas that aren't applicable to you. And you can just mostly work in these applications in the domains area. <clears throat> so if you wanted to um, use Create Digital, to install WordPress, what you would do would be log in to Create Digital and you would go into either all applications or the WordPress application uh, directly. And you could learn a little bit about WordPress. You've already done that today. Um, look at some of the new features. You could look at a live demo or a showcase. And then if you're ready, all you have to do is hit install this application. Once you have done that, you are able to select the location to which you will install WordPress. So I am going to choose one of my subdomains that I've created, and you can also select a subdirectory to install the instance. So I'll do demo 0206-2024, just to give myself a unique URL. So you can see here that I've created a URL for my website. Scrolling down a little bit, I would always um, suggest that you use the most recent recommended version. Uh, you can choose a clean WordPress install, or you can work with a couple of different templates. Of course, read through the end user license agreement and accept it if you do accept it. Um, scrolling on down here, you will want to uh, create a, an administrative username and password. You use your network username and password in order to log in to create digital, but when you're creating these um, WordPress instances or application instances, you'll create a new username and password that is unique to this site. You could give your WordPress a site if you wanted to do that. And then once you are comfortable with all of your settings, hit the install button. And believe it or not, in under a minute, we are going to have installed a new WordPress instance. So you can see right now that it is installing WordPress. We'll give it just a moment. And you can see that um, my installation is complete. So right now, you know, we saw that we titled it my blog. I would certainly want to give it a better name than that. But again, I see the URL that was created when I first installed my site. I also see the administrative URL. So anytime you're logging into WordPress, you'll have your site URL slash WP dash admin. 
And that's what's going to allow you to log into that administrative dashboard. So moving on, we are going to demonstrate how you would use WordPress once you have an instance of it. Um, any WordPress version of WordPress that you install is going to behave similarly. You can even use um, free WordPress through WordPress.com, although you have um, probably more limited options if you use that. But you can follow along and observe uh, for when you want to create a digital project in the future, or if you already have a WordPress instance, um, feel free to pull it up and move, uh, work along with me. So, like I said, this is your administrative dashboard. You can save this URL if you want to do so. You can always log in through your Create Digital account if you don't want to save it. Um, this is your administrative uh, sort of behind the scenes dashboard. From this landing page, you can choose the different content that you want to appear when you first log into that dashboard. So. If I don't necessarily care about learning more about the new version, I could dismiss that. I can also adjust in this top right my screen options. Like for example, if I don't want to be presented with my login attempts every time I first log on, I can hide that. I could hide WordPress news or events, hide the screen options again, and I can drag and drop to make my uh, dashboard more friendly to what I want to see. At any point from this dashboard, I could come up to the top left, hover over it, and select View Site. That's going to bring me back to the front end, however it looks at that current moment. And then to return to the administrative dashboard, again, I hover over that top left and just select Dashboard. So this dashboard is really where all of the editing magic happens. Uh, I want to show you some of the settings in this left toolbar. So if I hover over Settings, you'll find that I have uh, several uh, subcategories. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I do want to look at some of them. Uh, the first selection is general. This is where you can choose to change your site title. So we'll do demo. And tagline. Uh, I would not recommend changing your, your, your URL here because it will break things. Um, instead, you want to make sure that you maintain the one that you originally created. Uh, you can adjust your site language if you wanted to do so. But that's not going to, of course, change the language that you post uh, content, but it will change um, <clears throat> all of the administrative language. You can also adjust how you want dates to display, what time, time zone you're in, and your time format. Then save your changes when you've made your adjustments. Moving back down to settings, uh, I can look at writing. And that is going to tell me what my default post categories will um, be set to. Uh, as I'm creating new posts, I can create new categories. So I'll have more options here in just a moment. The reading section is fairly important. This is going to show you what your home page displays when people land on it. So right now it is set to display my latest post, which is really great if what I'm creating is a blog, but if I'm creating more of a, a, um, a static project and I want a landing page, instead I might choose a static page for my home page. And once I've created some of those pages here, I would be able to select from those to create my landing page for everybody. Uh, you also can show from the discussions tab how you want people to be able to interact with your work. So you could um, you could turn on or off comments. You can uh, edit your email notifications. Uh, I do suggest being a little bit cautious with those comments. WordPress does tend to solicit some spam. Um, so I don't suggest allowing anybody to comment right away. Another thing to look at is the media tab. Media is visible because this is going to show you uh, how your media appears. You can adjust the height and the width, and you can look at your permalinks. This is how your WordPress is going to formulate permalinks as you create posts and pages. Moving on a little bit in this toolbar, I want to point out users to you. 
Um, I mentioned that you're probably not going to be doing this by yourself. So if you are partnering with other people and you want to add them as um, users on your WordPress site, you can do that in this section. So if I were to add a new user, I could grant them a username, make sure you're, you use their correct email, uh, and you can generate them a password if you wanted to do that, and let them know that you have created them an account. With the role, that's what you want to pay attention to the most. So essentially, you don't want to give folks more power than they need, because these roles basically define the actions that users are allowed to perform. Administrators are able to do anything. They have full access. And so I'd probably avoid giving anybody that you um, is not working at the same level as you the administrative role. Uh, editors is a high level role that they can manage content, but they can't make site wide changes like uh, adding plugins and themes. An author is a person who can edit, create, um, delete their own posts, but they can't edit pages or alter other users content. And then, of course, you have your contributors, who is basically a lower level of authors. They can't publish post or upload media. And subscribers can only read posts on the site. So if you had subscription content, uh, that could work in that way. <clears throat> so moving beyond those basics there, let's take a look at the appearance of the site. Appearance is really going to dictate how others interact with your work. And themes are probably the most important component there. These are the tools that change the layout, the design, and the functionality of your site. You can easily change your theme to adjust all of these different factors, but you want to be careful changing themes um, if you're in the middle of a project, if you've already added a lot of content, because there are some features that are available on some themes that aren't available on others. So I'm going to come back and talk to you about themes a little bit more in a minute. But first, I'm going to actually um, switch to a different theme that you may already be familiar with. Uh, it is the um, 2021 theme. So what you do is you hit install, and then you activate that theme to turn it on. Um, the reason I did that is because 2022 to 2024 are really neat themes. They take lots of advantages of um, block themes and full site editing, so you can adjust settings across the site a little bit more quickly, but it's a little bit more advanced, and um, it's not something that we'll have time to cover today. But if you were to use it, you would see that some of the many um, individual appearance features that we'll cover in a second um, would probably be removed, and we would be more, more be more using a full site editor instead. So within certain themes, um, you will see over here in the left that you have additional options under your appearance button. Uh, customize is going to change the look and feel of your blog from within your theme. So, for example, I could change my site identity. Uh, you'll recognize where I just added in my title or my tagline. I could change those here as well. I could also add a site icon if I wanted to do so. I can also change the overall color scheme of my site if I'm not a fan of the screen. Perhaps I might want to change it up. Also, I could change on dark mode support here. I could also uh, add a background image for my site if I wanted to do so. So let's go ahead and do that just to see what it looks like. And so you can see that that makes a really big, and in this case, um, unfortunate change. You can, uh, of course, adjust the image position if you wanted to do that. You can also change whether you want it to fill the screen, uh, whether you wanted it to repeat, or if you uh, add a background image and you think, wow, that is way too much, you can go back and remove it. Also, I want to talk to you about menus. This is um, something, a menu is exactly what it sounds like. This is where you can, you know, you can create, you can edit, um, you can adjust all of the different um, pieces of content and how others discover them from the, throughout the site for easy browsing. So um, this particular theme has two menu options that is going to vary based on your theme. And from these uh, settings, you can adjust the order of those menus. You can add content that you've created to that menu. Like, for example, if I've created new web pages, I could add them here. Uh, I could even add uh, specific categories that I've tagged my post with or my pages with into that menu. 
Uh, you can also choose whether or not you want to automatically add new top level pages to this menu. So for example, um, if I change contact into a, um, a sub page under a parent page, and I had just done that, and I did not have this checked, um, at any point that I added a new parent page, it would go here. I think I got twisted up on that. But basically, whenever you add a new one of these um, default pages, you can change to make sure that it's included in that menu without having to do it manually. You can, of course, also work with widgets. Um, this is really nice here. Uh, you can pull in lots of good functionalities, including things like um, search bars, calendars, all sorts of things. This is uh, probably going to be showing, at least in this theme, in the footer. So if you scroll down, you can see all of these are widgets. If I don't like any, I can click on them from these little three buttons. I can choose to remove them. You can see that that's gone here. Or I can hit this plus button and I could add a new widget. So if I wanted to add a calendar, you'll see that I've added that. It shows up here. At any point that I'm done customizing or I want to save my changes, what I'll do is I'll hit this publish button. And that is what makes the changes live on the website. So when I feel pretty good about what I've done um, with my customization, I can close out and I'll be returned to that administrative dashboard. Here in the media tab, um, you can upload media on the fly as you're working with creating your content and your pages or your posts. Uh, but if you chose, you could also go to your media library and you could add new media content right from the start so that you don't have to upload it as you're uh, working through your um, pages. So we'll give it just a moment to upload those. Once you've done that, you can click on any of them. You can add your alt text, you can add captions and descriptions. Um, you should add your alternative text so that your website is accessible and user friendly. Um, at the moment, we're gonna go ahead and skip over it for the sake of time, but make sure that that is something that you do as you are creating live content. And you will also notice that you have some tools right here. Two things to point out are the import and the export buttons. Um, this is really nice because if you have created a WordPress site elsewhere, you can actually exit using this little button right here on that site. And then you can import it if you want it to be hosted on Create Digital. And that's a very, very easy process. So moving on, let's talk about actually building your content. You can do that in a couple of different places. You have with WordPress something called Post, and you have pages, and these behave very similarly, um, but there are some differences. So posts here are basically current content, things that are happening right now that are presented in reverse chronological order. Um, think, you know, blog style. Pages, on the other hand, um, are static, standalone content, and those are the things that usually can be found by clicking a link on a menu. And of course, like I just showed you, um, these can be formatted in a hierarchy to show as parent or children pages. So if you are creating your site and you think, I don't know if I should create a post or a page, a good question to ask yourself is, is this something that maybe other people would share on social media? And if the answer is yes, it's probably a post. And if the answer is no, then it's probably a page. So. Taking a deep breath, we are good with the toolbar and the administrative dashboard. Um, so I wanna talk about how you can now actually add content to your site. There are a couple of um, distinct but valid options for working within WordPress. And the first is that you can use this blank WordPress site like we have here, uh, and you can use editorial blocks, which we'll show you in a second, to completely customize your post your pages and your content. Alternately, you could download a more structured theme. You can even download full website templates to work with then, and you can edit that content um, that's been pre-populated to suit your needs. And so we'll talk about both of those a little bit. So when you are creating a new post or a new page, and you add a new page, you are going to be working with the block editor. Um, this is something that WordPress um, introduced in 2019. 
And anytime you log into WordPress, for the most part, it is going to walk you through using the editor, the block editor. Um, so I'm going to close out of that but and demonstrate how that works. So you will have the opportunity to title your pages or posts. So we'll say demo 2624. And that is my title. Um, <clears throat> I could begin to start adding my content right below here. And so at any point you can click below to create a new block. You can also hit enter or you can hit a forward slash. And that is going to allow you to choose the type of content block you um, are creating in. So be, by default, we are going to be working in a paragraph. So say, today we will. And if I kind of hover over that, I can see that I have a toolbar that pops up and I have this paragraph option. Uh, with that, I have the ability to format my text. I can uh, make it bold. I could add a link. I could change my text alignment. Um, I could create a pattern. And then I have additional block options over here on the far right. So this is where I could make additional adjustments. So I could change my text color if I wanted to do so. Um, I could change the background of that particular piece of text. And I could even choose my typography. There are lots of different things that you can adjust with each block. While I'm over here, I'll also point out these page settings. Uh, this is going to give you the overall page information. Uh, so if I, for example, wanted to change a featured image for my website or for that particular page, I could do that. And you won't see that actually until you preview the live page. Uh, you could change your page attributes. Uh, like for example, where does this page show within the context of the website? And so you can spend a little bit of time um, adjusting those options. You can also choose whether or not you want it to be publicly visible or whether you want to publish it right away or uh, later on. So we'll go ahead and close out of there and continue building the site. So I am going to hit enter and I will could either start typing or I could hit this little slash sign. And that is going to give me some potential options. If I don't like any of these, I could hover over my block and I'm going to get this little plus sign. That is the add block option. And from here, I could start typing to search for a content block that I wanted. So if I wanted an image, I could type that in and it would show me not only image, but some other alternatives that I might consider. Like, for example, would I like to include a gallery? Maybe I would like some media on the left or right and text on the other side. Um, Perhaps I might like to include one of the patterns that WordPress has created for me and customize that. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and select gallery. I could upload those again on the fly or right away. I could select those. I would have the opportunity to provide a caption. And again, with these, I'm going to have some additional options. I have options to customize each image as a whole or I can work with my content. So I can assign it center to adjust how it's showing. I have the ability to uh, work with wide widths if I prefer making that website a little bit uh, wider. All sorts of options that you have there. I'm going to go ahead and add another block just to continue demonstrating. And what I might show you is how you can embed content. So if I were to go to the University of South Carolina Twitter account. I could say, OK, I am at a. Post here that is demonstrating the use of robots to deliver food and I'm going to go back in. I'm going to just add this as a paragraph. I want to embed that tweet into my page. I could do that a few different ways. I could actually hit this plus. I could search for Twitter, which still shows it's Twitter instead of X, actually. Um, click on that, it would allow me to embed the URL. Or I have just, oops, an embed option that will allow me to embed into content. But WordPress is very smart. And if I just start typing in the URL, well, that's not what I meant to click on. Give me a moment. 
excellent paragraph. And I want to copy this, paste that in. It is going to recognize that it is a tweet that it wants to embed into the site. And of course I could um, change my alignment if I wanted to do so. Um, if I decided that I wanted to move that further up on the page, I just hit this little uh, move up sign or I can move it back down. I could um, work back on this particular area. Um, if I wanted to, I could even add a caption to this. So this tweet shows and so on and so forth. Uh, another couple of cool things that I just show you is if you were to provide um, one content block that you thought maybe would be more appropriate as something else, uh, WordPress is generally going to be um, smart enough to recognize that as well. So if I had maybe a quote and I started typing, okay, um, once upon a time, so on and so forth, um, I could add a caption. I could hit this button on the far left where this is a quote and it might suggest that instead I change that into a pull quote. So again, it's going to recognize similar content types, give you recommendations um, that might additionally suit your needs. If at any point in time, you're just not really sure what type of content block you have, you can always hit that plus and you can also select this browse all button. And that is going to open a window that is going to show you all of the potential uh, blocks you could use. So you have text blocks, media blocks, design blocks, like for example, if you wanted something in columns or if you wanted to create buttons or a separator, uh, you have those widgets that I mentioned earlier, you could embed within your page. Uh, you even have specific embed links for the type of content that can be embedded into WordPress. You can also look to these patterns that I mentioned. So if you wanted, for example, a call to action, you could scroll those and select one of those. Um, you could maybe check out different patterns that you like. Maybe you wanted an image pattern, say, I like this. I can pop it in and then I can go back and I can you know, relate, replace that image with something in my media library or something that I want to upload. And then with this uh, tool, you can go back to your media option. And here you have access to your images, you know, the ones that you have uploaded or something called the Openverse. And these are images that are openly available for you to use on your website. And you can search through the Openverse to find some content that might uh, work for you. So we'll go ahead and pop that in. So it gave us that reminder that these are things that can be removed um, if WordPress um, or the search provider uh, feels the need to do so. So those are some things just to be a little bit more thoughtful about. And that's what I talked about too, you know, making sure that your, uh, your content is consistently available. So at any point you can save your draft. From this top right, this little screen button um, right here, you are going to see a preview link. You can look at how it would show up on a tablet or on a cell phone or on a desktop. So I'm gonna preview it on, in desktop mode on a full screen. And here I see, okay, I have my title. Here's that featured image that I have, my paragraph, my gallery, my tweet, my quote, you know, all sorts of information. So it's not maybe the most beautiful web page in the world, but what that shows me is that I can do all sorts of manipulating to get these web pages looking exactly how I want them to look over time. So saving, going back to the WordPress dashboard, I want to kind of go back and, and talk to you a little bit more about how you can easily change your theme or use a plugin to totally customize your site. So you could, if you wanted to, go back to this appearance section and search for themes. And with these themes, you can look for things like museum templates, education templates, exhibit templates, lab templates, um, even research templates. And so the first thing that you're going to see is a search bar to look at your installed themes. You want to select add new theme. And here you can explore um, popular themes, the latest themes, or you could search. And what I might search for is, I don't know, we'll say an exhibit. And what I look see here is that, okay, this is maybe a really nice um, template, what I, or nice theme. What I could do is I would could preview it, 
or I could install it and activate it to make it live. And then I would have access to this really nice theme that I could work with then. Moving on to plugins, I also have some nice options for working with my site here, um, just extra little functionalities for me. And some of these are maybe not little functionalities, they're big functionalities. Because here you, if you add a new plugin, you can find things like page builders or even visual editors that make editing and building your website a lot easier for you. And so just like um, a moment ago, you can search across plugins. Uh, you can, again, I like to browse the popular and the recommended plugins, but what I might do is I might search, say I was creating a digital project and I wanted to build a, a timeline. And I might think, oh, that's really nice. Okay, this is compatible with my version of WordPress. There's no cost. I can um, learn a little bit more about it, read the user agreement and install now if I wanted to do so. I could even look at those starter templates that I mentioned here. And this would give me um, ready to use templates that work within most but not all WordPress themes that will give you um, the basics of building a web page that you can just download and then um, customize yourself. Uh, maybe page it, pair it with a, um, a page builder for a really nice seamless building experience. So I don't want to get bogged here down here, and I know we're coming to the end of our time. But what I want to point out to you is that even if you aren't a programmer or a web developer and you don't have any experience with web design, it is still completely possible to create your own website for your digital research or your digital project. Um, I've given you some tools and some resources that you can use to create digital projects, um, particularly using uh, WordPress to enhance, enhance and build up your research and scholarship. Um, and, I, and I hope you're able to use these and create something really amazing. Uh, you're always welcome to reach out to me to talk more about planning a project or the resources that are available to you. Um, if you'd like, feel free to reach out because I am um, more than happy to talk. So I am going to go ahead and stop.